New realities demand new responses by the church and its ministry. And in terms of learning, theological education, preparing leadership, discipleship, all these must always respond to what is the new context. We need to respond in a way that opens itself to the multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual reality of what it is. If not, we will bypass what God is doing. The heart of Cum is what I have talked about often, almost coined the term in a sense, is contextualized urban theological education. What Cum has stood for from day one, 1976, when I began the, the center, is to respond to those who have been disenfranchised, who were marginalized from the typical theological institution. And we contextualize it by approaching uh, the students in terms of course, in terms of the curriculum, in terms of who we serve. The language, we teach in six different languages. Rather than prepare a curriculum or, or school and say, this is what you have to study, this is the curriculum to prepare you, uh, you all come and match that. We rather say, what is the reality? We have a diversified urban constituency in our cities. We define the courses and the curriculum to fit uh, the reality of the different needs, culture, history, class, constituency uh, that's there. So a contextualized theological education basically means that we follow the model of Jesus Christ. A curriculum is contextualized when it adapts itself. It expresses an urban kenosis, it's empty itself of its prestige and power, identify itself with the people, and designs courses to be affirming excellence, yes, but that excellence defined by the context. And it's interesting because the model uh, has been used and copied in different parts of the world. We have friends and, and former students and faculty who are in Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, teaching and using CUME as a model. I took a class that explained how we would um, plant a church. And that's exactly what we did. Our church is a church plant. Um, and and we, I got that learning from CUME um, studying here. Um, so that is a, indeed a blessing to understand that we work within the city and God used the city to reach the rest of the world. And one of the other things for me has been this whole matter of spiritual formation. And even though it is being debated as a new term, I saw where it has really helped our ministry to propel in nurturing new believers so that they can understand that we should know Christ until he's formed in us. So spiritual formation has become my passion as a result of attendance at God and Conwell, Boston. We need to be able to go back to scripture, get the biblical principles that really make for a, a, a contextualized theological education, which has this component of action reflection uh, as a epistemological uh, truth, a reality of what truth is. It is not just simply theory, it's not just simply practice. It is a combination of theory and practice informed by each other. And that we find in the School of Samuel, Jesus' disciple, and, uh, and Paul in School uh, uh, in Acts chapter 19. And if we can go back and get these principles and apply it to a present reality, we'll realize that we are going to be developing a cutting edge, uh, 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 a really dynamic, uh, responsive to the reality uh, theological education that's needed. As God leads us into new realities, our preparation as well as our work needs to recognize and embrace them. A city without walls means a new kind of learning. I've been given three minutes. That, that's a new kind of learning. <laughs> Wrote a little notes to keep me tight. Now, I I'm really delighted to introduce uh, the speaker this morning. Uh, a personal friend for over 25 years. Uh, you know him as a professor of New Testament and as the dean of the Boston campus of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, CUNE. Now, there are a lot of things that you might know about CUNE from your brochure. He's a graduate of Villanova University graduate of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and a PhD from Drew University. He also founded a school of theology for the Assemblies of God in upstate New York. He's a biblical uh, studies teacher at Naya College and a pastor in the Presbyterian Church in New York City. Now there's a few things you might not know about Al. 
Now, before I mention that, I, I need to be, uh, not too pedantic, but I need to mention a, a few elements about what I call excellence in ministry. Because you see, excellence in ministry uh, demands uh, certain virtues or quality that at a minimum, I've, I've noted down three. Now, I'm not going to speak long. Three P's. People know me. I like alliteration. Excellence in ministry requires at least perseverance for the long haul, passion for justice, and to be a person of compassion. Now, al Khadija has demonstrated these marks of excellence throughout his life, throughout his ministry, in different venues and at different times. But did you know that al Khadija was at Villanova University, a track star? He was a long distance runner. That's a real one. Did you know that Al Badia was an affirmative action officer in Haverhill? He worked for the mayor and he was so passionate for justice that he was fired. <laughs> and finally, did you know that Al Badia and Kathy, his wife, at this stage of their life, they're adopting, in the process of adopting a little boy, Jose, a man of compassion, a man of love. So I present to you this morning a man of perseverance, a man of passion for justice, and a person who's a person of compassion, Dr. Padilla. Thank you so much, Alvin. Uh, adopting Jose was very selfish. I realize I'm too young to be a grandfather, so I better. <laughs> it's a joy to be with you. A new kind of learning. An introduction to contextualized theological education models. It is undeniable to all of us, particularly in this room, that the ethnic cultural composition of our North American society has indeed changed in the last 50 years, <coughs> resulting in the changing face of American Christianity rather quickly. All of us here today are well aware that the numerical epicenter of Christianity has shifted to the global south, South America, Africa, Southeast Asia. A century ago, North America and Europe comprised 82% of the world's Christians. Today, it is less than 40. Closer to home, it is estimated that in North America and the United States by 2050, that's not too far away for most of you, 50% of the population will be non-white. Sooner than that, by 2025, 50% of all children, 18 and under, will be non-white. Indeed, the world is changing and we better adopt a new kind of learning. Turning to scriptures, even though those of us who read scriptures realize, and even the casual reader, that there is a great deal of, that the Bible is a broad collection of documents spanning millennia in composition, multiplicity of literary genres, and diverse in its content. Yes, there is diversity even in the composition of the Bible. Yet, there is at the same time little doubt that unifying theological themes can be readily discerned throughout the voluminous pages of our scriptures. For centuries, Christians have read and talked about this wondrous collection and discerned that embedded in all these differences and diversities, there was a single voice, and that this voice was personal, the voice of the triune God. It is that diverse God that we, I want to speak to you about. In Genesis 1.26, a passage well known to all of us, it is the cultural mandate. Humanity is charged with creating culture. By the time of the prophet Isaiah, I don't know how many millennia later, humanity has indeed evolved into many cultures, resulting, sadly, in a state of enmity among the nations and cultures. The poet prophet expresses his longing for a day when all the different cultures of the world would gather together on the mountain of the Lord. And I quote from Isaiah 2, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. 
and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations of the world shall flow to it. And the prophet Isaiah envisions a time when peace and justice will prevail since the Lord sits the throne and all humanity comes to worship him. 800 years after Isaiah, we see the fulfillment of this wondrous prophecy on the day of Pentecost. All the nations are present in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord, and they hear the wonderful news of God's gracious offer of salvation in their own tongue. This fulfillment is only in part for the time being, for we see later on in 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, that those who claim to live on the slope of Mount Zion, on the mountain of the Lord, must live as foreigners, as aliens in this society. Christians must live as aliens ascending daily the path towards the summit of the mountain. In reality, those of us who are believers in this room know that those who rule the earth see us as undocumented aliens who have no right to be here. Finally, we see in Revelation a great vision of how it will all turn out. A vision of our arrival at the final summit at the gathering of God's people from all nations, cultures, and languages. And the prophet John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robe with palm branches in their hands. What a wonderful vision, how it all will end up. Although we see the idyllic vision of Revelation 7, 9 just quoted, and hear in it the melodious harmony of many languages and cultures weave together into an intricate symphony of unequal beauty, the reality is that most in our North American society see only disunity and hear cacophony. On the day of Pentecost, you will remember, when the Holy Spirit descended upon those gathered on Mount Zion, it was only those who were from foreign lands who were able to discern what was going on. The rest said, why are not all these people who are speaking Galilean? How is it that we each hear them in their own language? On the other side, those who were native born, end quote, the dominant culture in Jerusalem of the day could only mock and say, they are full of wine, they are drunk. They too heard the apostles speaking in their own language. But that was no miracle. But they all spoke kind of way. Trusting in the familiarity of their own cultural preferences, in this case language, they were unable to grasp the significance of the miracle happening literally before their eyes, the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2. The only reaction is mocking, for they do not understand what God is doing. If you would grant me some homiletical license, these persons would be the ones caucusing for an Aramaic-only statue in Palestinian law. <laughs> I am afraid that a significant segment of the evangelical church in North America finds itself in the same dilemma. The words of God are manifested for all to see, yet we mock them, for they appear to be nothing but rabble of uneducated men and women speaking nonsense. In the Presbyterian church that's so familiar to me, there are many who cannot fathom how God could use the apparent, quote, indecency and disorder, end quote, of these churches. <laughs> Particularly those who label themselves Presbyterians. Early in the 21st century in which we live, the Christian church, the evangelical church, finds herself in a challenging position as we confront the multicultural, postmodern, and pluralistic world in which we have been called to be a witness to Christ. At best, we are perplexed and bewildered, not knowing what in the world God is doing through us. At worst, at worst, some of us claim the death of the church and even Christianity itself. We hear that daily ignoring the tremendous growth of Christianity in cities like Boston among the insignificant rabble. Still others see the next wave of Christianity emerging over the southern horizon 
and long for the arrival of its powerful undertow to a very short that it may take hold of the North American church and sweep it under its power, give it new learning to reinvent itself. I pray that you are in the latter group as I am. Indeed, the whole world has come to our doorstep. It is gathered together here this morning. We, we need to learn to live well in the diverse culture of North America, and it is no longer an option. It is a necessity for you and for me. Although the, the West has indeed lost the numerical <coughs> lead in superiority, it still it retains a powerful grip on the church universal. We in the West assume that we speak ex cathedra for our Christian God. Our theology that is formative, that it is to be followed. It is our theology that is normative. Our way of being the church, the standard for all to follow. In the area of theological education, we continue to assume that Western educational methods work best for everyone. English to be preferred. We have not dared to envision new ways of learning to serve the increasing ethnic and cultural diversity of the overwhelming our society. We are unwilling to reinvent ourselves. It should be noted, for example, that current practices in American seminaries, American theological education, reveal that theological schools remain, remain enamored with pedagogical systems that are dated, increasingly irrelevant to our communities, and are disconnected from both the global and local realities of our churches. They fail to incorporate Hispanics, Blacks, and other in leadership roles at all levels of the school structure, and neglect paying attention to issues of particular relevance to ethnic Americans, such as immigration reform, healthcare, poverty, violence, education, etc. There are many challenges facing theological schools in the 21st century, and the challenge of dealing well with the differing histories, worldviews, languages, dialects, and cultures is the most significant and the most overwhelming. <coughs> Indeed, we must learn to reinvent ourselves. While Christianity in North America continues its progress towards the creation of a multi-ethnic church, seminaries are marred in monocultural. Yes, there are mission statements, and I researched all of them, indicating the world's, the school's commitment to ethnic diversity and its desire to attract non-white students. However, these statements are rarely, rarely accompanied by significant multi-ethnic presence among the faculty and senior administrators. Recently, I spoke with a colleague from another seminary in the midst of searching for its chief executive. A comment he made surprised me. Hurt me indeed. He commented that the majority culture finds it difficult to follow someone who is non-white or has a notable foreign accent. Of course, if it happened to be a Scottish accent, that's okay. <laughs> With opinions and comments like that, no wonder. Seminaries lack ethics among their senior leadership. What my colleague demonstrated with that comment is the school's lack of intentionality in its pursuit of ethnic diversity. Though its mission statement clearly indicated the welcoming stand of the stranger, as long as he pays to be here. The challenge to diversify staff and faculty is endemic to Christianity because of our commitment in principle to the equality of all. Christian institutions, <coughs> seminaries, and churches must diversify or risk making a mockery of our belief that all men and women are made in the image of God. Amen. We mock that statement. <laughs> the fact is that ethnic Christians in North America, as ethnic Christians, Christians we find ourselves confronted with the reality of being marginalized in the context of our own faith tradition, evangelicals. We identify with American evangelicalism on the broad scale, and indeed many of us are immersed in evangelicalism. Yet, 
evangelicals, it could push us out. As my colleague Dr. Ra has stated, he'll probably mention this tonight, I grow weary of seeing Western white expressions of the Christian faith being lifted up while failing to see non-white expressions of faith represented in meaningful ways in American evangelicalism, end quote, particularly in seminaries, in education. Indeed, God is performing a great thing, a great transformation in the church and in seminaries, a transformation that is shaping the very core of what the church is, how we are structured, how we meet, when we meet to worship, in what language, with what instrumentation, women and men with diverse backgrounds. It is transforming how we envision and deliver theological education. And it has to be done differently and more proactively. Indeed, the Pentecost nature of Christianity allows us to create new paradigms. It enables us, empowers us to create new paradigms for witness evangelization. Instead of rejoicing, many find themselves threatened and on the defensive, wondering where all this heterogeneity is not merely the babblings of a world falling apart. They are drunk in the end of the morning. Yes, Christ is transforming presence among us, providing with the willingness and the power to adapt ourselves to missionary ministry in the postmodern world. But we have to be willing and intentional. Look at the opportunities some of this ethnic diversity provides for the church and for seminaries at this time. Just take, for example, Hispanics Americans. Look, that is very dear to me for obvious reasons. <laughs> in 10 years, 2020, Hispanics will make up nearly 25% of all U.S. residents. Just as that. Researchers predict that by the end of this decade, Hispanics will make up more than 50% of all Catholics in the U.S. It is estimated that if this trend continues, uh, half of all Hispanics will belong to Protestants by 2025. I mean, that is a significant number. The question we need to answer ourselves as leaders of congregations and seminaries is, how many of them will join the church you will be leading? How many of them will come to study in your seminary? For theological seminaries, this implies that they must seek ways to make theological education accessible and practical for Hispanic Americans and other ethnic minorities that are among us. If we are to take seriously Revelation 7 9, then we will understand that becoming a multicultural church or seminary is not a condensation of the white dominant culture to facilitate evangelistic efforts among ethnic minorities among us. And I hear that far too often. Lowering the standard, con condescending. We have to lower ourselves to meet their needs. Rather, it is the elevation of every one of us, including the white dominant culture, into something far greater, far better, more marvelous and more wonderful to become the people of God. Amen. Years ago, I heard a story that was meant to illustrate the great humility of the great Civil War General Robert E. Lee. It is a warm spring day at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond. As the minister is about to present Holy Communion, a tall, wet-dressed black man sitting in the section reserved for African Americans unexpectedly advances to the communion rail. Unexpectedly, because this has never happened before. The congregation freezes. Those who have been ready to go forward and kneel at the communion rail remain fixed in their pews. The minister stands in his, his place, stunned, motionless, not knowing what to do. The black man slowly lowers his body, kneeling at the communion rail. After what seems like an eternity, an older white man rises up. His hair snowy white, head up, eyes proud. He walks quietly up the aisle to the channel rail. So with silent dignity and self-possession, the white man kneels down the communion along the same rail as the black man. Now, this illustration was used to highlight how Robert E. Lee lowered himself so that this black man could receive him. My opinion, he misses the story. It was the black man who elevated Robert E. Lee to greatness. Because he brought him into the very presence of God, allowing him to be one with God. 
And it is that idea of condensation, looking down upon people, that we must avoid in order to welcome the stranger among us. Yes, there are ways to have many ways to admit Hispanics, Blacks, and others in our seminaries. And becoming a multicultural community is not an easy task. You have to be intentional. <coughs> Far too often, schools are interested in the quantitative quota. We will be multi multicultural if we have members of that community within us. Simply numbers. As I often tell the pastor of the church that I go to, having me in the pew does not make a church multicultural. <laughs> I mean, my family and others. It's the form of structure. It's who sits in the front, who leads worship, who preaches, who teaches, who leads. It is like that in seminaries. Seminaries would welcome Hispanics, Blacks, and others, Asian, Americans, and many, many others into their halls to study. But only as students not a being part and parcel of the ones who make decisions. As Christians, we must learn to take seriously what the early church did, how they did things. Have you noticed, for example, in Acts 6, a great event. The church has been growing rapidly, and now they have their first cultural conflict. The widows of the Hebraic Jews, excuse me, the Hellenistic Jews, Greek-speaking Jews, complain that their widows are being neglected by the Hebraic Jews, those who speak Aramaic. And what do the apostles do? Led by the Spirit, they select, they elect members from the oppressed group to lead them, to get them out of this mire. Can you imagine? I was wondering about this. If the formers of the US Constitution had stopped to ask the black men and women uh, should you be counted as a human being? <laughs> How different our story is as a nation. The sad, sad story is that we are not able to really grasp how God is leading us to new ways of living. In empowering others for Christian service, theological institutions, educational institutions, and the church has many multi-layered problems, there's no doubt about it, many challenges. There are finances, there are people, there is leadership, all kinds of issues. How we prepare our students and would be disciples to live in a multicultural, multi-ethnic world that is largely free from racism is our goal. But we must do so compassionately. The word prepare in the above sentence suggests an educational process. This is a process that will take time. One of the key objectives of educational institutions, such as seminaries, is the reshaping of life in relation to human purpose. It is my goal, objective, to reshape the lives of our students that they may better serve in the society and culture God is calling them. For theological schools, this implies that we must seek ways to reshape our students to enable them to live world in a multicultural world. The work of the church is expressed through koinonia, community and communion, diaconia, service and outreach, the charisma, proclaiming of the word, and dedicate teaching and disciples. To foster an environment of multiculturalism within our educational institutions, theological schools must seek to create a climate that embraces this work of the church. How can this be done in educational institutions? So laden with traditional structures that resist change to the core in order to enable them to become a multicultural community? That is quite a challenge for seminaries. The process of developing, for example, curriculum that fosters multiculturalism begins when members of the institution come together to discuss issues relevant to multicultural communities. That is koinonia. We do not begin with our curriculum. But listen, what do they need? Secondly, the school's leadership drafts and develops an intentionally anti-racist, pro-multi-ethnic statement to be adhered to by all. Do we have an anti-racist statement 
that we will not tolerate anti-racism among us, that we will be proactively be to become a multicultural community. This, this discusses strategies, policies, and legislation to, to needed to promote multiculturalism. And then, this won't be accompanied by an action. You must, you must be intentional about your mission statement. Again, a mission statement that simply says we welcome everyone is totally useless. Totally useless. Unless you make sure that everyone does come. And then you stand up when you notice that people are not coming. <laughs> yes, our goal should be not that we may learn more about different cultures, by the way. Nor should our goal be to simply be better able to navigate cultural differences. That's what people call multicultural. How can I navigate? How can I avoid offending someone? That goes through. It's a good start. Don't get me wrong. Our goal should be to develop what missiologist David Livermore calls cultural intelligence. Mm -hmm. Cultural intelligence. Cultural intelligence is a meta model that is not, not created by uh, Livermore, it's borrowed from someone else, from sociologists, which provides a coherent framework for dealing with the array of issues involved in crossing various cultures at the same time. For if we live in a multicultural world, we will be crossing cultures constantly on a daily basis. Cultural intelligence deals with people and circumstances in unfamiliar contexts on a daily, continuing basis. It measures our ability, your ability and mine, to move seamlessly in and out of a variety of cultural contexts. Many of us learn this simply intuitively. Having grown up in the city, with different cultures around us, and we adapt. It takes a great deal of knowledge of the cultures, interpreted, interpretation of the same, perseverance, <clears throat> knowing that you will make mistakes, but you persevere, but above all, behavior, that you change how you look at things. Amen. Yes, it may be easier to adapt our message our curriculum and our programs, but adapting ourselves mm. is a far greater challenge. Mm. Cultural intelligence provides us with a mechanism by which we can gauge our commitment and level of cultural interaction and contextualization. What does it look like to contextualize ourselves to the various cultures where we find ourselves in a given time and place? What do we do when we encounter the other, the stranger, and how do we react to her or to him? That is the challenge we face. The challenge you will face as you venture out to minister in the name of Jesus Christ in the multi-ethnic, multiculturally, multilingual society God has called you to serve. Allow, you, allow me to end with a model of you very briefly, which you saw in the video that preceded you. A Gordon Conwell Q has grappled with the realities for decades, since its foundation by Elder Villafay, determining to provide contextualized theological education in its holistic dimensions, both evangelism and social justice, theology and practice, hand in hand, never separate, always together. In doing so, Q must structure itself to be in the city, of the city, and for the city and for its people. That, brothers and sisters, is contextualization. Be in the city, of the city, and for the city. The Lord greatly bless you.